Welcome to Cincinnati Sessions, a production of the University of Cincinnati Internal Medicine Residency. I'm your host, Sarah Ludvigson, and today our topic is primary adrenal insufficiency. Let's get started with our case. Today, we have a 31-year-old female presenting to the ED with altered mental status, weakness, and abdominal pain. She has no known history and is on no medications, but did undergo an outpatient ACL repair this morning. Her husband also reveals that she's had several months of fatigue, anorexia, and dizziness. Vital signs reveal hypotension and tachycardia, and physical exam reveals a lethargic thin female with skin notable for hyperpigmentation of the nail beds and palmar creases. She also has some diffuse tuner palpation of the abdomen. Her labs are notable for hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, a low bicarb, mildly elevated BUN and creatinine, and a low glucose. This patient was given three liters of IV fluids in the emergency department with no improvement in her blood pressure. She was started on pressors, broad spectrum antibiotics, and admitted to the ICU for undifferentiated shock. I'm going to pause here to ask today's question. What are the next best steps in the management of this patient? Pause the video and try to answer this question for yourself. And if you're next to someone, present the case and discuss it together. After you try to answer the question, resume the video. Let's start by reviewing some normal physiology. The cortex of the adrenal gland is made of three layers. The zona glomerulosa, or the outermost layer, is responsible for making mineral corticoids like aldosterone. Aldosterone is secreted in response to elevated renin levels and acts on the distal convoluted tubule of the nephron. Here it promotes potassium and hydrogen excretion and sodium resorption, which increases blood volume and blood pressure. The second layer of the adrenal cortex is the zona fasciculata, which releases cortisol. Cortisol plays several important roles, especially when the body is under stress. One of these roles is promoting gluconeogenesis in the liver, raising blood glucose. During times of stress, the hypothalamus releases CRH, which stimulates ACTH release from the anterior pituitary gland, which then stimulates cortisol secretion from the adrenal gland. The third layer of the adrenal cortex is the zona reticularis, which releases androgens like DHEAS, the precursor for testosterone. Failure of the adrenal gland to produce these hormones results in primary adrenal insufficiency. Several pathologies can result in primary adrenal insufficiency, including some like autoimmune infection like TB, HIV, or fungal infections, metastatic disease, adrenal hemorrhage, infiltrative diseases, and many more. In primary adrenal insufficiency, you lose both mineral corticoids and glucocorticoids. So you're going to see high potassium in the blood, low sodium, hypovolemia, metabolic acidosis, and low glucose. High stress states can result in an adrenal crisis, which can lead to shock and death. If you suspect adrenal insufficiency, you should collect a paired ACTH, cortisol, aldosterone, and plasma renin levels. In adrenal insufficiency, you would expect your cortisol, aldosterone, and DHEAS levels to be low, and in response, you would have high plasma renin and high ACTH. If you expect adrenal crisis in your patient, you should not wait for these labs to result, but treat empirically with IV fluids and stress dose steroids, typically done with 100 milligrams of hydrocortisone, followed by 50 milligrams of hydrocortisone every six to eight hours. If your patient's initial testing is consistent with primary adrenal insufficiency, once they have stabilized, they will need lifelong therapy with mineral corticoid and glucocorticoid replacement, which is usually done with hydrocortisone, 15 to 25 milligrams a day, divided into two to three doses with the highest dose in the morning to simulate normal physiology, as well as flutrocortisone, 50 to 100 micrograms daily. Don't forget that these doses will need to be increased when the body is under increased stress to avoid adrenal crisis. They should also follow up with an endocrinologist, 
for confirmatory testing with a cosyntropin stem test, and also to investigate their underlying cause of adrenal insufficiency, which usually includes things like antibody testing and possibly a CT of the abdomen, chest x-ray, and testing for tuberculosis. Now let's revisit our question of the day. What is the next best step for treatment of this patient? And the answer is to collect a paired ACTH, cortisol, aldosterone, and plasma renin levels, and to start stress dose steroids with hydrocortisone as soon as possible. And now some questions for reflection. What hormones are produced in the adrenal glands and what are their functions in normal physiology? Would you, ex would you expect renin, ACTH, CRH, sodium, and potassium to be high or low in primary adrenal insufficiency? And what advice would you give to this patient on discharge? Pause the video and try to answer these questions alone or with a friend. Try to say the answers out loud. If you have to, rewind the video to find the answers. Thank you for watching this Cincinnati session on primary adrenal insufficiency. Be sure to check out other videos in this series. 